The period between the ancient and the medieval is commonly known as the early medieval period in Indian history. It ranges between 650 CE and 1200 CE. This phase brought in regional features in socio-economic, political and cultural life across India. Among the epigraphic documents, copper plate charters form the bulk of the relevant sources for this period. These copper plate charters narrate the process of transfer of the landed property and help in understanding rural settlement patterns, revenue demands and so on. They also throw significant light on the contemporary merchants, craftsmen and markets. When you are talking about this period, first thing that you have to do is to have to place this period in the backdrop of regional formations, both in the formation of society, economy, political and cultural. When you are looking at the sources to study the non-agrarian sector of economy, we find that there is a great change in the sources and that comes in the form of the copper plate charters. Yes. You know about the copper plate charters. Yes. Now these copper plate charters generally talk about the land grants. It talks about the rural uh, stratification in the society. It also talks about merchants. It also talks about markets. So these are very important for our study. In the literary domain, what is important is that we have to rely on the Smriti literatures, the Dharma Shastras, mm -hmm. the technical literatures, and even to the creative literatures, which sometimes gives us information, not in a very explicit manner, but in an implicit way about the non-agrarian sector of economy. Apart from these sources, a very important source in this period is the letters of the Jewish traders. And these letters give us information about the trade networks that happened during the, uh, with the western coast of India and with West Asia. The urban centers of the early medieval period should be discussed in the light of a debate on urban decay. This debate relates to the formulation of the Indian feudalism. The proponents of this debate were R.S. Sharma, B.N.S. Yadav and V.K. Thakur. There was a kind of uh, contraction of the urban phenomenon in this period and so it is said urban contraction vis-a-vis -vis rural expansion because of the expansion of agrarian surpluses due to the land grant economy. So there was a kind of opposition between the land grant economy and urbanization. They actually based their arguments on the documents provided by some field archaeological materials and also from the writings of Swan Sang. When Swan Sang came to India, he gave us a detailed description of the territories through which he moved. And there he talked about certain centers that they were de decaying. And taking you from that, this formulation talks about a decay in the urban centers, which were at one point of time very important in the early historical period. Now, as against this, it has been said by D.C. Sharkar, B.D. Chattopadhyay, and R. Champakalakshmi mm -hmm. that these documents are not properly utilized and they talk about urbanization, urban phenomenon in this period where we have inscriptional evidence of a series of urban centers, particularly in the domain of the Gurjara Pratiharas, who were ruling in northern part of India. By studying the inscriptional evidence, B.D. Chattopadhyay was of the opinion that there were different categories of urban centers. The nature and character of these urban settlements differed. Very often, a hierarchy of these settlements could be noticed. For example, we have reference to an urban center called Prithudaka, which is in present day Pehoa in Haryana, and it is particularly referred to as a place where there were Ghotaka Yatras, which means that fairs for the trading of horses. 
So naturally, a ghotak, a place where there is a ghotaka yatra, is not same with another urban center like Siadoni, where we have, which is known as a puro pattana, and where we have wide roads, reference to wide roads, big houses, hot to margo, like mm. leading the place leading to the market space. So you have different kinds of urban settlements. Again, you uh, know about Gwalior. Mm. The ancient name of Gwalior was Gopadri or Gopagiri. It is being referred to as a kotta. So what is a kotta? It is actually a military settlement as well as an administrative set settlement. So in case of Bengal also, we have different kinds of urban centers with the suffix called pura, pattana, and then for we have different kinds of markets also. Mm. So all this takes us to one point, and that is that we had immense urbanization in the early medieval period. It is of course true that the urban centers which were very important in the early historic period, some of them decayed. But at the same time, there are some which continued, for example, Mathura, Ahichatra, yeah. this kind of, you know about yeah, this. Yes. So they, they actually continued as an important urban centers. And there were certain other urban centers which just came into focus. In South India, temples were the main focus of economy during this period. There were two very important urban centers. One was Kudamukku Palyarai and another was Kanchipuram, which grew out of the temple complex. Mm. Because uh, in South India, temple was the main mm. focus of economy in that period of time. The term third urbanization was coined by B.D. Chattopadhyay. He was of the opinion that there was a change in the nature of urbanization from that of the early historic period. And what was that difference? The difference was that in case of second urbanization, there was an epicenter. And this epicenter was in the middle Ganga plains. Mm -hmm. And from where actually the characters of urbanization diffused. But mm -hmm. in case of third mm -hmm. urbanization, there was no epicenter. It is actually extremely rooted to the regions. And this is rooted again to the kind of formulations that we find in early medieval period where we have regionalism, which is the basic character of early medieval period. So naturally, B.D. Chattopadhyay said that this period we can be termed as third urbanization. Since we're talking of urban centers, were there crafts and industries during this period? Yes, it's a very pertinent question, I must say. And uh, most of the crafts were agro-based, crafts and industries were agro-based industries. Why agro-based? Because, you know, with the expansion of land grants, many cash crops began to be yielded. Mm -hmm. And this, among these cash crops, we have sugar. Sugar came up as a very important industry. We have immense number of references to sugar industry in inscriptions, in literature, and even in the Chinese and the Arab sources. Another industry that flourished during this time was textile. We find mention of important textile centers. Mulasthana, which is present day Multan, then Anahila Pataka in Gujarat, and our very own Bongo region, where we find that which is now in present day Bangladesh. Mm -hmm. And the textiles of the Vanga region is very much uh, eulogized in the writings of the Arab geographers. And in case of South India also, we find that textile became a uh, textile industry, weaver's craft, it became a very important uh, specialized craft area during the early medieval period. Apart from that, a new industry came up, that is the oil pressing industry. And we have references to the oil presses in this period. So, and it is referred to as ghanoko in the literature and in the inscriptions also. Among the crafts, the use of metal became very important during this period. The innumerable land grants in the form of copper plate charters testify to the extensive use of metals. The use of bronze was also very popular during this period. Chola bronze are very famous. Mm. So we have bronzes, we have bronze images, and apart from the cholas, 
bronzes are there in the Pala period also in Bengal. Mm -hmm. So we have this kind of things. And from the present day Bhagalpur region, uh, which is known as Anga, which was known as mm -hmm. Anga in early times, we have reference to very good quality swords. So swords mm -hmm. were being made in this region. Bengal, for Bengal, octo alloy was very important. Which, uh, which actually flourished in this period. We have images of octo alloys. Mm. So these are the different kinds of crafts that grow. The crafts gave rise to important formations, such as the guilds. In the early medieval period also, we have references to guild-like organization. I would not uh, like to call it guilds, but rather it is better we call guild-like organizations because guild is an European term. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And guild-like organizations, the names which we find mm -hmm. in the inscriptions are like Sreni, Puga, Goshti, these sort of names we find. The guilds were not acting as banks anymore. That means the trust of the craftsmen were not so much with the guilds. And why was it so? This was, the reason for this was that we have multiple centers. We have multiple headmen. All the guilds had a headman, mm -hmm. and the basic character of the guilds was their cohesive nature. And so this cohesiveness was missing in the early medieval period. So when for a particular guild, you have so many, a new number of headmen, mm -hmm. so naturally this cohesive character was missing and then we find that gradually in the early medieval period, the guilds were being converted into jatis. The Suvarnakaras were guilds of the goldsmiths, while the Karmakaras were guilds of the blacksmiths. So these guilds, this, when we get these jatis, they were originally goldsmiths and gradually they were crystallized into castes. So, okay. which we call jati. jati yeah. So, naturally their cohesive character was missing in this period. But this was not the case in South India. South India, it was totally different. There we have merchant organizations which flourished like anything. They were involved not only in intra-regional trading, but also inter-regional inter trading. Mm -hmm. Which means, suppose a guild from Karnataka is also engaged in trading with a guild with from Tamil Nadu. So they were having exchange networks and they were actually moving. And among this, uh, the guilds from South India, we find that the most famous was a guild known as 500 Swamis of Ajavole. Aihol's ancient name was Ajavole. Mm -hmm. So this 500 Swamis of Ajavole, they actually formed this guild in the Karnataka region. Mm -hmm. But gradually we find that they were moving towards the south mm -hmm. and then they concentrated in the Tamil Nadu region. Mm -hmm. Apart from this, they also got interested in the maritime trade network. Mm -hmm. So they were involved in inter-regional inter trade, they were involved in intra-regional inter trade, and they were also involved in yeah, overseas, overseas trade network. Apart from this, we have other guilds known as Mani Gramam. Then we have Nana Desi, mm -hmm. Ainu Ruvar. So we have different kinds. We have so much of guild-like formations in South India that it became a very important part of the whole economic network during the early medieval period. The early medieval period brought in regional features in socio-economic, political and cultural life across India. The copper plate charters form the bulk of the relevant sources for the early medieval period. There were different categories of urban centers during the early medieval period. These settlements differed in their nature and character. In South India, temples were the main focus of economy during that time. The textile industry flourished during this period. Among crafts, the use of metals like copper and bronze became very popular. The crafts gave rise to formation of guilds. Then just now you told us about the merchants. Could you please highlight us on the trade network during this period? Yeah, absolutely. So you are very right because when we are talking about merchants and uh, naturally the question of trade comes in. Mm -hmm. Ranavir Chakravarti's work on the copper plate charters 
and other inscriptions and the literary sources, of course, have shown us that we cannot have a blanket category of margins. We have various terms, designations for these margins. For example, a merchant is often called a Vanik, he is mm. called a Vaidehaka, mm. he is called a Sreshti, mm. a Raja Sreshti, and what not, and even Nakhuda, the ship owning yeah, merchant, yeah, no yes. Vittaka. So when you have this entire vast category of merchants, which are indicators of prolific trade, Without trade, you cannot have so many type of merchants. And again, you have merchants dealing on single item. For example, we have Nemoka Vanija, that is a merchant who is a working on trading on salt. salt. When we are talking about the markets, what we find that in the rural level, in the base, we have the hottos, that is in the villages. Mm -hmm. So we have hotto, hotika, and then we have in Deccan, we have these terms known as Oddo or Sante. Mm -hmm. So these were village level markets and these were perhaps periodic in nature. These Hottos or Hotikas formed a very important part of the entire uh, scenario. In the urban centers, you have the Pattanas. Between the urban and the rural market centers, there was a middle category market center. It acted as a linkage between the rural and the urban centers. These were also of three different categories. Ronobi Chakravarti has discussed these market centers. One is the Mondopika, which is known in the uh, North India. The second is Penta, which we find in the Deccan region. And the third, that is in the far south, we have the Nagaram. Uh, this the word mandi yeah, which we yeah, normally later, use yeah, today yeah. actually it goes back to mondopika mm. which meant a covered hall where you could uh, sell your items mm. the products that were being brought in were mainly agrarian products mm. but we had references to spices we have references to animal trading also yes. and some very exotic items this indicates that merchants markets sustained in a land grant economy and they are not opposed to each other. Ma'am, what about the long distance trade? First, just think of the map of India. What we find is that we have two coastlines. Mm -hmm. One is the western seaboard, other is the mm -hmm. eastern seaboard. So the linkage, the maritime linkage was from both the sides. The western seaboard was generally linked with West Asia, the eastern seaboard was generally linked with Southeast Asia. During this period, two important sea routes were very active. They were the route along the Persian Gulf and that through the Red Sea. When the Gujarat coast or the Konkan coast is active, it shows that the Persian Gulf lane is active. Mm. But when we find that the Malabar coast is in prominence, mm. it is the Red Sea lane that is in prominence. Mm. And apart from this, we have the coastal voyages also, coastal trade network. We have Quilon, a very important port in the Malabar coast, which was actively trading with Goga, a court port in the Konkan coast. Daibul was one of the most important ports of this period along the western coast. We learn about it from the Arab sources. Apart from West Asia, the port of Daibul had linkages with Sri Lanka also. Other than Daibul, the other important port of the early medieval period was Kambay. It was also known as Srishtambapura. Apart from Kambay, in Gujarat, we had two other important ports. It's probably a little smaller in size. Mm. They were Somnath and Goga. Mm. And it, we have records where we know that in Goga, people from Hormuz used to come. Mm. In the early historic period, the most important port was Brigukacha or Barugaza. This time, Bragubaza has faded. So you see that when I was talking about the urban center, I said that some urban centers declined, but mm. some others grew up. Yeah. So same was the case with the port, that when we have the decline of Barugaza, mm. we have the growth of Kambay. Kambay becomes very important as a port. Along the Malabar coast, the two important ports were Quilon and Manjurur. We have this Jewish merchant letters which talks about direct contact 
between the ports of Malabar and Aden or the ports in the Red Sea Lane. And they talk about that iron was always being shipped from this port to the other port. During the early medieval period, Indian trade with Southeast Asia flourished along the eastern coastline. Three primary sections along this coastline were the Bengal Delta, the Andhra Kalinga coast and the Koromandal coast. In case of Bengal Delta, we had till the 8th century, we had a very important port known as Tamrolipti mm. and it occurred profusely in different kinds of inscriptions and different kinds of literature. But with the decline of Tamrolipti in the 8th century, we find that there was the rise of another port in the present day Bangladesh region. It was in, located in Chittagong, Chattogram. Mm -hmm. And the name of this port is Samandar. And we know this from the writings of the Arab geographers. The port of Samandar was suitably located. It was in the Chittagong region. Therefore, it had a vast hinterland and also had an extensive foreland in the Arakans region. Coming to the Koromandal coast, in the earlier period during the time of the Pallavas, we have Mamallapuram, mm. Mahabalipuram. Mm. And we know that Pallavas regularly had linkages with countries of Southeast Asia. Mm. This is evident from the inscriptions that have been found in Southeast Asia. We find that the characters they are written in a script which are known as Pallava Grantha script. That is, there was some kind of exchanges from this region towards the countries of Southeast Asia. After the Pallavas, when the Cholas rose into prominence, they raided a number of countries. During this time, many Tamil merchants settled down in most of the kingdoms of Southeast Asia. An inscription from uh, Bharuj, that is present day Baruz in Indonesia. This inscription talks about a settlement of the Tamil merchants and it talks about the guilds of Nana Desi and it's very interesting they just completely changed the name of the area and they gave a Tamil name to this area. Mm -hmm. It talks about the vast network of commerce mm -hmm. that was moving around both in the western sector and also in the Eastern sector. Some of the dynasties during this period did not mint coins. But recent research by John S. Dale, B. N. Mukherjee and others have brought to light the fact that this non-availability of money is a fragile argument. On the basis of coin hoods, John S. Dell had shown that in case of the Gurjara Pratihara domain, mm. numerous coin hoards have been discovered. And these coin hoards suggest that there was a very strong monetization in this period. So on the basis of that, Dell has formulated that the coins that has been found from these hoards surpasses the major dynasties of early India, for example, the Guptas, even uh, the Sultanates, and mm. they are equal to the Kushanas or something like that. Coming to B.N. Mukherjee's formulation, we find that when we are talking about uh, non-minting of coinage in the Palo and Shena period, it is absolutely true. We don't have a single coin in the name of the Palo ruler or in the name of the Shena ruler. But what we have is that in areas in southeastern Bengal, which is known as present-day Shamotato and Horikelo, mm. and it is in Bangladesh, mm. this area gives us an uh, image of extensive monetization. Moreover, from a region called Moinamoti in the Kumilla district, there an Abbasid gold coin has been found. And this Abbasid coin reflects that this coin came by way of trade. Otherwise, how oh. could we have an Abbasid coin here? Mm. So the Abbasids were having trade networks, having trade contacts with this region. Secondly, as for Horikelo Shamatata coinage, we can say 
that the thesis of monetary anemia does not stand here because as I've said before, uninterrupted coinage, mm. different kinds of denomination in coinage, naturally they, they were acquainted with the coins. Probably it might so happen that the rulers were not prone towards monetization and it was not one of their agenda of inventing coinage. The early medieval period brought in regional features in socio-economic, political and cultural life across India. The copper plate charters formed the bulk of the relevant sources for the early medieval period. There were different categories of urban centers during the early medieval period. These settlements differed in their nature and character. In South India, temples were the main focus of economy during that time. The textile industry flourished during this period. Among crafts, the use of metals like copper and bronze became very popular. The crafts gave rise to formation of guilds. Between the urban and the rural market centers, there was a middle category market center during this period. Two important sea routes were very active at that time. They were the route along the Persian Gulf and that through the Red Sea. Important seaports of the early medieval period were Daibul, Kambe, Quilong, Manjuru, Samandar, and so on. Coin was minted by some of the dynasties of the early medieval period.